Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Friday uh, on Wednesday. Did we get up through Horatio's speech on 1240? Excuse me, Bernardo's speech on 1240, where he says something like, "Is not this something more than fantasy?" And then I drew our attention back to these. Okay, I did do that. I was just making sure. <clears throat> Then, did I get through or talk about why they're standing watch? Did Horatio talk about that? No, he didn't. Okay. Page 1241, Marcellus wants to know why they're keeping watch. Okay. So Horatio goes into some detail and discusses that they're keeping watch because young Fortinbrata of Norway the son of the previous king of Norway, who's just called Norway, um, is kind of on the warpath. He's, he's proving his mettle, so to speak. He's not king, he's nephew to the current king. So notice, Norway, dead king, brother becomes king, son doesn't. Denmark, <coughs> dead king, brother becomes king, son doesn't. But there's a different reason, a different cause of death for the two kings. Previous king of Norway was killed by Hamlet Sr., dead king of Denmark. Okay? So his brother took over. One can assume in that instance it's because the dead king of Norway's son wasn't old enough. Okay? So his uncle became king. With Hamlet, dead king dies, brother becomes king, but Hamlet is old enough to be king. There's a problem there. So, um, they go on, they keep talking, and they're standing watch because they're afraid, Claudius is afraid, Fortinbras of Norway may march on Denmark. If you few happy few would sign that, I'll give you points or something. Um, so they keep talking. Horatio suggests that having seen the figure of the dead king, um, that this is an omen. It portends something evil. And Wednesday was March 15th, and Horatio mentions about what happened ere Julius, Julius Caesar, fell when he was killed by Octavian. Octavius, um, excuse me, when he was killed by Brutus and Cassius and those guys. Wednesday was the Ides of March, when Julius Caesar was killed in 44 BC. So it was the 2000 whatever, 23 and 44, 67, the 2067 anniversary of the assassination of Caesar. So the ghost comes back out, line 126 or so. And Horatio says, I'll cross it, though it blast me. I'll cross it means I'm going to get in its path. I'm going to stop its progress. And he says, one, two, three, four things to the ghost. He gives him four, um, what, four questions, so to speak. If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. Okay. The ghost spreads its arms. What is that footnote for? 129. I don't understand a lot of this. The ghost, or perhaps Horatio. If it were Horatio, it, the stage direction, which is probably in the early printings and the first folio, wouldn't say it. It would say he spreads his arms. Utterly asinine. So, if you can speak, speak. It doesn't. Second option. 
If there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. It doesn't. So notice that one. That's, you know, the first one is just, if you can speak, speak. Second one. If something good can be done that does one of two things, or either of these two things, that does ease to you and or grace to me, speak. If I can somehow alleviate your suffering, I'll do it. If you can somehow bring grace to me, meaning divine grace, do it. It doesn't do anything. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily for knowing may avoid, speak. If you know something bad's going to happen, speak, and I'll tell those in power, and we'll stop it. Right? How well did that end up for uh, Oedipus? Mm, it didn't work out so well. Or, final one. If thou hast supported in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say you spirits off walk in death, speak. Why? What good is it going to do if the ghost speaks about some buried treasure it had? How is that going to help anything? It goes back to the a Christian idea, and bear in mind, Hamlet is supposed to be said, entirely Christian society, that What's the purpose of wealth? The early church fathers talk about this. We see it in old English poetry. Okay, um, The purpose of wealth is to be distributed. It's to be given out. It's not to be hoarded. Uh, cupiditas, what is it? Cupiditas es, mas, es malorum something. Um, avarice is the root of all evil. Avarice, greed, love of money, okay? What Horatio is suggesting is if you have buried gold somewhere, treasure, and you tell me about it, I will dig it up and I will dispense it. It will no longer be hoarded, right? The popular, one of the popular beliefs about ghosts in, in Shakespeare's day as well as today is why are they ghosts? Because some people are ghosts and some people aren't. The vast majority aren't. So why are some people ghosts? Unfinished business. Bingo. Unfinished business. You've got something to do that you didn't do before you died. And you got to get it done. Okay? Great film that, that kind of tackles it. Oh, and I can't remember the title. And I can't even remember all the actors. Um, British comic... Richie Gureas, a couple years ago, plays a dentist, just a rotten SOP. Okay? But it involves death and ghosts and having to do something before one can move on. Uh, Richie Gureas and uh, Rory, not Rory Kinnear, the brother, the other one. Greg Kinnear, thank you. Um, great, great film, by the way. Look it up. So, it doesn't speak. Marcellus, shall I strike it with my partisan? Like a, like a staff with a spike and stuff on it? It's a ghost. What good is that going to do? Okay? The cock crows. Horatio gives us more information. Okay? Marcellus then says, some say that ever against that season comes wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated, that is, Christmas, it's coming close to Christmas time. The bird of dawning singeth all night long, and then they say no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome. So as Christmas gets nearer, the rooster apparently crows all night long, and ghosts Stay where they're supposed to stay because the sound of the cock crowing is, you know, harmful to them. It shoos them away, so to speak. All right. So that scene ends. Scene two, room of state. 
That means highly decorated, highly ornate, big, like ballroom. Go to Buckingham Palace, go to Hampton Court Palace, and you can go into rooms of state that where they have, you know, they welcome kings and queens and presidents and things like that. And Claudius and his entourage come in. The queen, his courtiers, everybody. And Claudius gets a nice big speech. Though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it us be fitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe, meaning my dearest brother, Hamlet Sr., has not been dead for very long. And it was fit and right and meet and proper for the entire country to contract, not to issue, enter into a contract, but to contract, to come together in sorrow, like what happened in Great Britain last fall when Queen Elizabeth died, when they had the Queen's funeral. Everything shut down. Absolutely everything. Okay. Things like that don't happen very often <laughs> in England. I was there one year teaching my Harry Potter course. Um, summer of 2005, when they we flew over the day of the bombings in London, two bombings, bus bombings, etc. A week later. They did a, I don't remember what it was, like a five or seven minute moment of silence and everything. Tubes stopped mid-run. Buses, trains, everything just to a standstill. Okay? So, yet, what does yet introduce? If we're going to see another word that's going to be like yet, but. You can do such and such and such and such. But, or yet, what do those always introduce? Some kind of problem, some kind of contrast, some kind of opposition. Okay? You are free to do, but, that means you're not free. <laughs> okay? Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with remembrance of ourselves. Who's this we and us and ourselves? It's the royal we. It's me, myself, and I. Okay? What does he mean? Discretion fought with nature. Nature, one's body, does what when a loved one dies? Sorrows. Discretion involves what part of one's faculties? Mind. It controls, not heart. The mind controls the emotions. Discretion kind of wages war with the nature and says, down boy, time to take control. Okay? So, discretion together with remembrance of ourselves has done what? Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen. The imperial jointress to this warlike state. Your footnote is not very helpful. Or your gloss. It gives you a legal definition of the word jointress. That's not what Shakespeare means. Shakespeare means to be joined with. What? This warlike state. What is this warlike state? Two meanings. Myself and Denmark. Gertrude is now joined to myself. Why? Because they've married. And she's joined to this warlike state. Why? Because Claudius in British monarchic thought, monarchic legal thought, political thought, the king is the state. Kind of like we saw in Antigone and Oedipus the king. Okay? Or the queen is the state. We have letters from Queen Elizabeth where she is referring to herself as Britain. 
He says what? The imperial jointers to this warlike state have we as twere with the defeat and joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth and funeral and with dirge and marriage in equal scale, weighing delight and dole taken to wife. So he's got a lot of juxtapositions there. Defeated joy. Do you want joy to be defeated? No, it means joy that's, that's lessened. It doesn't mean destroyed. It means a joy tempered with sadness. It's kind of an oxymoron. Okay? An auspicious and a dropping eye. Dropping means tearful. Auspicious means kind of looking forward. Again, they're kind of opposites. With mirth and funeral, you don't want to be happy at a funeral. Unless the person who died is just, you know, really horrible and you're glad they're dead. But even then, you don't go and deliver a dislogy, right? You deliver a eulogy, the beautiful word. You don't go up and stand, I'm glad Ted's dead because he was a dirty, rotten SOB and just... And with dirge in marriage, I mean, where have we seen another work that we've read where we've had this kind of funeral and marriage discussed? Minister's black veil, right? The same day he shows up with the black veil, there's a marriage and there's a funeral. And at both of them, things aren't right. In equal scale, notice, weighing delight in dole, dole, sorrow has done what? Taken to wife. In other words, we tried to bring joy out of sorrow. What was the sorrow? Oh, my brother's dead. Well, I'm going to make something good come out of that. I'm going to marry his wife. Okay? Christian society, I had that read over here the other day, means what about this relationship? It's totally wrong. It's incestuous. Because in traditional Christianity, marrying your brother's wife is incest. Go back to the early parts of the Old Testament, totally okay. Okay? That's why the Sanhedrin come to Jesus and say, you know, you're talking about resurrection all the time. Okay, so there was this guy. There was this woman. She married a guy. He died. So she married his brother. Why? Because the law says she should marry his brother so that the brother will produce seed whose child will be named after the first dead brother. The second brother died. She married the third, all the way on to the seventh. Whose husband is she in the resurrection? Jesus goes, shut the up. You don't know what you're talking about. Anyways, so he's going to bring joy out of sadness. But he doesn't stop there. Nor have we herein, that is, in this action, marrying Gertrude, barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along. What has he just said? Everybody in the audience, seemingly, or at the very least, his courtiers and advisors and such, did. They agreed with the marriage. They said, here, here, <laughs> go for it. And by mentioning that, what is Claudius doing to slash with them? Not just my sin. Our sin. That, that's not the royal we. That's the collective we. You guys are as guilty in this as I am. Okay. I'm the one enjoying the sin, sleeping with Gertrude. You're not. But they gave assent to it. Okay? Germanic society. King, you know, while the king was quote unquote kind of all powerful, the king had electors. In the Anglo Saxon time, they were called the Wheaton, his counselors. Those counselors had a lot of power. They could disagree with the king and they could kind of sway the king's mind. He's saying, you all were in total agreement with this. So if there are problems, it's your fault, not just mine. Or your fault as well. All right? So he then goes on and talks about what was talked about in the previous scene. 
Why do we have men standing guard? Young Fortinbras, Norway's on the warpath. He's showing he's ready to rule, essentially. Okay? So he addresses a couple of the courtiers, Cornelius and Voltemont, and says he has jobs for them to do. They're going to be ambassadors. They step forward, a couple of lines, they leave. Then he addresses Laertes, the son of Polonius. Why are you here? And what he means by that is there was some mention of a suit, he says, line 43. He's not talking about clothing. A suit is an appeal. That is a request for something. What is it you want? I want to go back to Paris. Why? He's a student at Paris. Might be the University of Paris, might be the Sorbonne, we don't know exactly. More than likely though, because Paris was known as a center for legal studies, he's probably studying the law, okay? Gonna follow in daddy's footsteps, be a suck up to the king, you know, advisor. Sorry, my political opinion there, maybe not yours. So, he says, go ahead, as long as your father says okay, okay? And then he addresses Hamlet, 64. But now my cousin Hamlet and my son. Your gloss tells you, for cousin, any kin not of the immediate family. What's meant by immediate family? Nuclear family, father, mother, children. So it could be anything beyond that. Niece, nephew, 59th cousin, 60 times removed, you know, kind of a thing. Now my cousin Hamlet, that is, were not immediately related, and my son. What? How do you call him a son if you're not immediately related? And that's what prompts Hamlet's aside. What is an aside? Exactly. When a character says something that is actually like a soliloquy, it's revealing the character's thought, okay? But the character addresses the audience. And with an aside, supposedly nobody else hears this. So, but now my cousin Hamlet and my son, a little more than kin and less than kind. Hamlet's response takes Claudius's words and deals with them sequentially, okay? Little more than kin, that is, a uh, little more than just cousin. Why? What is Hamlet to Claudius? Nephew. Notice the wording of that. Because if it's what is Claudius to Hamlet, the response is, little clue here for quiz or exam. <laughs> Uncle. Words in the relationship have meaning, okay? So Hamlet is Claudius's nephew. In Germanic custom, in the Middle Ages, in the play, the, the Hamlet story is from the Middle Ages. In Germanic custom in the Middle Ages, the uncle-nephew relationship is the closest one. It's not father-son. Because nephews would often be raised by their uncles. The father would send the, ne would send the child, after he reaches you know, five, six, seven years old, off to the uncle to be taught, raised, how to be a man. Especially in a royal line. Okay? Because often, you know, that brother might be a king in his own right of another chiefdom, let's say. And so the other, the other brother king, because they might be kings of their own little areas, raises that child and teaches that child how to be a proper king without having to deal with the problems of yes, daddy, you know, daddy issues kind of a thing, all right? So, little more than kin, how so? You're my uncle. That's pretty close. And less than kind. Kind doesn't mean nice. It doesn't mean gentle. It doesn't mean compassionate. It means what? Natural. So a little less than kind means less than natural. We're more than just kin, 
But our relationship now is unnatural. What's the unnatural part? Son. Yeah, you <laughs> shouldn't be. You married my mother. You're my uncle, uh, Oedipus, slash father. Now, in his, Claudius is thinking. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? What does it mean? Why are you still sad? Why are you still sad? Okay. There's possibly an allusion to dress. Because Gertrude's speech is going to emphasize that. Clouds are what? They're dark. Okay. Not so, my lord. I'm too much in the sun. See, Hamlet hears Claudius' language, and he replies in kind. Oh, you want to use meteorological metaphors? Okay, we can do that. No, no, no. I'm not in clouds. I'm too much in the sun. What's, what does he mean by the sun? What did Louis XIV of France call himself? I think it was Louis XIV. The sun king. Why? Because I am the light that lightens up your world. When you look at me, you behold the sun. I am the sun for France. That's what's meant. It's part of the divine right of kings ideology. Okay? So Hamlet says, not so, my lord. Tone it down, you know. I am, what does he really mean? I need to get the hell out of Elsinore. I need to get away from you. Good, Hamlet. Dearest Mother Gertrude says, Good Hamlet, cast thy knighted color off. Now, that is always taken to mean change your clothing. Stop wearing what's the traditional color of mourning? Black. Okay? Why are you so much? How did Claudius put it? Why do the clouds still hang on you? Dark clothing. I think is what he's suggesting in one sense as well as the other sense. Cast thy knighted color off and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Notice, talks about his eye looking like a friend, that is looking friendly to Denmark. Does she mean going around Copenhagen and the various places and smiling at, no. What does she mean by Denmark? The king. Because the name of the country stands for the name of the king. Let thine eye look like a friend on Claudius. Now that is suggesting something. How does he look at Claudius? Not friendly. Do not forever with thy veiled lid seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest his common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Okay? What does she mean, veiled lids? Is he walking around, eyes closed? No. Why do they only see his eyes veiled? Because he walks around looking at the ground. That's why she says, Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek thy noble father in the dust. When everybody comes up to Hamlet and he's like this, they don't see his eyes, they see his eyelids. Why is he looking for his noble father in the dust? Because he's dead. From dust to dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And then she has, you know, colon. And then you get, thou knowest tis common. What is common? What comes after? All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. In other words, your father isn't in the dust anymore. Father's passed on to eternity. You're not going to find him down there. How long has this father been dead? Your introduction says two months. Play's not clear about that. At one point, the play suggests, Hamlet actually suggests, it's been a month. Another point in the play, someone says, I don't think it's Hamlet, might be one of the grave diggers. Suggests it's been twice two months. So somewhere between a month and four months. Okay. 
So what's the import of her? Thou knowest tis common, all that live must die. Suck it up, man. So your daddy's dead. Deal with it and move on. I, madam, it is common. You've got a gloss down there, 70, whatever it is. It is common, but it hurts nevertheless. Possibly a reference to the commonplace quality of the queen's remark. Commonplace quality of the queen's remark may mean, really means the utter emotionlessness of it. The utter lack of compassion. How old is Hamlet? Do we know yet? We will know by the time we get to the end of the play. How old does he seem? He's a student, right, at Wittenberg. The king's going to tell him in a few moments, don't go back to Wittenberg. I want you to stay here. So if he's a student, what do we assume? Late teens, early 20s. Maybe he's a graduate student, late 20s. Maybe he's a perpetual student, you know, 40s. <laughs> he's not in his 40s. Why seems it, she says, let me back up, if it be, if death is the common theme of human existence, meaning it is common, why seems it so particular with thee? Why does death seem so particular, so special to you, Hamlet. Now, what do you think? Let's say you're, you're thinking of this play. You're writing it. What's your immediate reaction to that going to be? Because he was my freaking father. That's why. That's why it's particular. But Hamlet doesn't go there. Hamlet, again takes her words, just like he took Claudius's, okay, and then just dissects them. So one of the things we see early on about Hamlet, I mean, his very first speech, a little more than kin and less than kind, tells us what about Hamlet? I get what you mean. Define snarky. Okay, but when you're snarky or snappy, what does it mean you have to be able to do? Louder? Smart with your words and smart with your understanding. That is, he listens to Claudius and he says, you damn fool, you do not understand the real meaning of the words you are using. Here, let me learn you something. His mother says, seems, why seems it so? particular, what should she have said? Why is it so particular? Because Hamlet latches on, th on seems, seems, is, as I've talked about before, is a subjunctive verb. It indicates a condition contrary to fact. It seems like a sunny day. No, it doesn't. Nor does it seem particular to Hamlet. Seems, madam, nay, it is. How is it particular? Because the particular person who died was the particular one who produced the sperm that made Hamlet. That's how particular. And Shakespeare's getting into whether you want to deal with it or not. Some pretty deep philosophical stuff. Particulars versus universals. The stuff out there versus the everyday, ordinary things down here. I know not seems. Tis not alone, my inky cloak. Good mother, because she called him good Hamlet. Again, the guy takes words and just throws them back in their face. Tis not alone, my inky cloak, telling us what color his cloak is, nor customary suits, the clothes underneath the coat, the cloak of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, <sighs> sighing all the time. No, nor the fruitful river in the eye, the tears, nor the dejected behavior of the visage, the sorrowful, frowning face all the time. 
or it could also be the face looking down at the ground all the time, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief. What are forms, moods, and shapes? You could kind of go back to Theseus' speech. Those are giving shape to grief. Where's the grief? The grief is the idea. It's the thing imagined. Or it's the thing in here that can denote me truly. When we get to poetry, we're going to have terms. I don't know why it's only included when you get to poetry and why they're not included earlier in the book. Your editor is going to talk about the differences between denotations and connotations. What is the denotation of the word B-L-U-E? It's a color. What is A, because there's more than one, connotation of it? Hamlet. He's blue, right? It's a mood, not a color. Hamlet says these things, these forms, shapes, etc., moods, these don't denote. They don't say the true me, their connotations. No, he says these indeed seem. Why? For they are actions that a man might play. The other day I'd written down here some themes or issues in the play. You know, uh, watching, observing, looking, spying, etc. And it had religion, suicide, and other things. This is a biggie. It's huge. How many people within the play, at various points, pretend to be people they aren't? Or they put on masks? Or, gee, let's go back to one of the first things you read. They have bound veils. I have that within which passeth show. That is, it surpasses playing. It surpasses giving form to. He's saying, it's the real me. These, these are the trappings and the suits of woe. Because you can change your suit moment by moment. You can take one off and put on another. And the smart people, you know, think of the gallery, the seats around the globe. The smart people are probably thinking, you know, kind of like actors. They come out on the stage, they go back in, they change your costume, they come back out. Huh, there's something going on here. The king responds. Notice, Gertrude doesn't. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. In other words, way to go. That's what a son ought to do. A son ought to mourn his father's death. But, time's up. That's his point. Time for morning's gone. Why? We're married. Celebration time. <clears throat> and the implication, partly of this scene is, I'm not saying that this is necessarily truly the case. It's kind of implied. This is almost like this is the wedding party. After the marriage, like the marriage was just a few moments before. But you must know your father lost a father, right? What did Gertrude say? You must know it's common that is death. That father lost, lost his. So your father lost your grandfather. Your grandfather lost his father, etc. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. Filial children should mourn the deaths of parents for a certain amount of time. Question is, what's the time? You get a month. And then you can read the will and you know, divvy up the... But to, again, but to persever in obstinate condolment is a course of, and he's going to list several things, okay? Persever, to persevere, to keep going on. Because you don't talk about persevering a really nice meal, right? That's 
something you enjoy. If you persevere, that means you're going through something really bad. To persevere in, what's meant by condolment? Condolences. I've had students, you know, email me, I'm not going to be in class, somebody died. You know, I, you know my condolences, etc. What does it mean? I feel for you, I understand, don't come to class, etc. You got to deal with your grief. Obstinate. Condolence. What's meant by obstinate? It's another word for obstinate. Could be unnecessary, but here it's more stubborn. He won't do what? He won't cue the Frozen soundtrack. He won't let it go. That's it. At some point, you have to let it go. Both my parents died within the last eight years. My mom in 2015, I think it was. My dad in 20, late 2020. You know, some of my siblings, I'm the youngest of five, some of my siblings, even a few years after, oh, I do this, mom, something. I'm like, really? Because I'm a cold-hearted bastard. You know, <laughs> really? Just move on. Okay? You know, quit, you know. My mom loved geese in one of them will send a little clip of geese flying over. Oh, look, Mom saying the last time. Stop it. Just stop it. I'm too much of a Claudius. So he says, your obstinate condolment, your persevering obstinate condolment is what? It is a course that is a practice of impious stubbornness. Or, as it's usually pronounced, impious. What does that mean? What is piety? Righteousness. Righteousness, devotion to God, holiness. This is impious. It's the opposite of that. It's unholy stubbornness. Right? You know, in terms of one's faith, one should be stubborn regarding one's faith if one has faith in something. That stubbornness might be devoted to science, it might, whatever. Okay? But if it's impious, it's wrong. All right? So, that's the first strike. What else? Tis unmanly grief. Unmanly means womanly. <laughs> that's what it means. It doesn't mean eunuchly. It's not like he's been castrated or something. It means you're acting like a woman. About the lowest blow that a king <laughs> could give a future king or prince. How do we know he's a future king or prince? Because he's going to finish the speech with mentioning that. Probably shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> so, what else? It shows a will most incorrect to heaven. And this ties back to the impious stubbornness. His will is incorrect to heaven. He's going against God's will. Why? Because it is God's will that your father died, and then his father died, and then his father died. Why? Because God controls everything. The whole Boethian notion of divine providence. St. Paul says, in all things, be content. He understood a bit about suffering, the number of times he was beaten and lashed, etc., Okay? A heart unfortified? Coward. That's what he means. What else? A mind impatient? Impatient. Impatient means not patient. What does patient mean there? Does it mean not willing to wait? Because that's the way we understand patient today to mean. It's not what it means. It means not suffering. A mind not willing to suffer. Because what are you when you go to the hospital? I was a patient. I suffered. Still am, you know. A mind unwilling to do what? To do something heaven's going to talk about in Act 3, Scene 1. Scene 1? Yeah, I think it's Scene 1. The most famous quote-unquote soliloquy in the English language, which is not 
actually a soliloquy. To be or not to be. Because he's going to talk about suffering the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Is the mind able to do that? Okay? In understanding simple, that is, you're a damn fool, and unschooled. How unschooled? It doesn't learn from reality. See, nature teaches us lessons. What are some of those lessons? Maybe, I'm trying to think how to put this. You know what a helicopter parent is? That's the parent who hovers over their child so that nothing bad happens. Well, what happens to that child when that child grows up? Uh, sh- almost, I really want to just go off on a tangent, but I won't. <laughs> the child can't deal with reality. The child cannot do, deal with sorrow, cannot deal with rejection, cannot deal with the world as it really is. It's like someone, here's an example, doesn't have to do with any of that. There, there is a condition where people are born without nerve endings in their skin. They have to be very careful. Why? Because they can accidentally stand next to a cooktop and put their hand on the cooktop and not see that the cooktop is glowing red. And it'll be 185, 200 degrees and their hands on it and they don't feel it at all. Even though smoke might start to rise and they'll start to smell burning flesh. That's when they know they're Harming themselves, okay? Unschooled, because their nerve endings aren't working. For what we know must be, and is as common as any of the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we, in our previous opposition, take it to heart? Our world, modern world, is so screwed up, I could just go off into all kinds of stuff. Why should we oppose the reality that exists is what he's saying. What's the reality he's talking about? Death. Peevish opposition. <laughs> Peevish. Like a little brat child. <laughs> shut. What's the shut up mean? This is reality. The stove is hot. You don't want to believe me? Fine. What's the best teacher? Nature. Experience. You gotta put your hand in the fire to realize, ooh, those beautiful glowing orange and red things. Those are hot, Jimmy. Here, let's learn. So, he says, tis a fault to heaven, you're sinning against God. A fault against the dead, you're sinning against your father. Okay? A fault to nature, all of reality. To reason most absurd, it doesn't make a lick of sense whose common theme, that is reason's common theme, is death of fathers. Deal with it. Put on your big boy pants. Go on. So, throw to earth this unprevailing woe. In other words, bury it. Just like we buried your father, bury the woe. Get up, dust yourself off, Move on. I tell my, my students when I teach um, my, my Tolkien rolling course, I've argued for years. The Harry Potter novels were about one theme, one main theme, from the beginning of the first book to the end of the seventh book, how to die well. Harry doesn't only have to learn how to die, because everybody dies. He has to learn how to die well. Well, because there are people who don't die well. Some of them come back as ghosts. Why? Because they weren't prepared to die. That's how you die well, being prepared. Hamlet is going to tell us that in Act 5. The readiness is all. So, he says, oh, by the way, Hamlet, you are the next immediate to the throne. And what he means by that is, Should something happen to me, you will be king. Why should he not have mentioned that? Louder? Because he killed the king. 
Okay, keep going. That's only part of it. Okay, what else though? Okay, fourth subject. What else though? Primogenitor. And what, what is that? The law of primogenitor. Hereditary kingship. If a king has a son, or if a king has a bunch of children, the eldest son is the one who becomes king upon that king's death. Elizabethan England. Elizabeth, Elizabeth was the second eldest child of Henry VIII. The eldest child was her half-sister, Mary. The youngest child was Edward VI. But when Henry VIII died, Edward became king. He was like 12 years old. Elizabeth was already late teens at that point. Edward died. Mary became queen. Why? Because she was the eldest surviving child at that point, not male child. In Germanic fashion, the eldest son became king. The council of electors, the advisors, they elected that person king. I mean, Donald Trump thinks he has a claim. <laughs> Hamlet has the claim, okay? Why isn't Fortinbras king of Norway? He's in the exact same position as Hamlet. His father's dead. His uncle is the king. It's assumed that the reason his uncle, who is not named, he's just Norway at this point, the reason he is king is because Fortinbras was too young to assume the kingship at that point. Hamlet's not. Okay, big, big difference. So, we don't want you to go back to Wittenberg. And Shakespeare chooses Wittenberg because it's historical significance, which we'll talk about in a few days with the Protestant Reformation, okay? So the queen says, Hamlet, let not thy mother lose her prayers. Stay with us. I shall in all my best obey you. King, why, that's a great reply, okay? They all leave. Three minutes. Hamlet gets a soliloquy. The first soliloquy in the poem. What is the soliloquy in the play? What is the soliloquy? One person alone on the stage revealing his or her innermost thoughts. There are no lies in soliloquies. Okay? Notice what Hamlet is thinking about in the first soliloquy in the play. Oh, that this too, too sully flesh would melt thaw and resolve itself into a dew. This version, this edition, okay, takes the sullied reading from an earlier printing of Hamlet. The first folio edition, published in 1623, reads solid. Oh, that's too, too solid flesh. In textual editing, textual criticism, my dissertation was an edition of John Donne's Holy Sonnets. There is a principle called Lectio Difficilior, which means the most difficult reading or the most difficult word. And when you have two variants, two choices of a reading, textual criticism essentially says you go with the most difficult one as the one that is what the author put down on paper or that the author intended. And that the least difficult one is probably either an error or something that someone thought the other reading meant. Well, these two words are very close in spelling. In Shakespeare's day, Sully wouldn't necessarily have two I's, uh, two L's. So you have an S, a vowel, an L, a vowel, and a D. Wouldn't necessarily have an E at the end either. So it could just be S-U-L-I-D in handwriting. Why? No standard spelling. That's why Shakespeare spelled his name three different ways. Okay? So, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Well, solid melting, duh. In other words, not the most difficult reading. Because what does sully mean? To sully something is to what? To dirty it. Oh, that this dirtied, tainted, 
sinned flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. What chemical process is being described? And what do you do when you, or, okay, evaporation, so you take water and you boil it and it evaporates. What happens if you collect that steam? And it is what? The condensed liquid is what? But it is pure. It's pure. It's distilled water. Distilled means all the impurities have been removed. Oh, that this, what? Impure, tainted flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a pure form. Take me, Jesus, now and refine me. Purify me. That's what he's talking about. Or, last minute, that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. Suicide. Hamlet, at this point, he's contemplating, he's thinking about suicide. Okay? We'll stop there and pick up with 133 on Monday. Read through Act 2 for Monday. I'm going to put up a quiz today. I'm going to verbally tell you, but I might change it when I actually post it, and you'll know um, how I'll change it by then. I'm going to put up a quiz that might be over Acts 1 and 2. Okay, That's what I'm planning on doing. It might end up only being over Act 1. It won't be due until Monday night at the earliest. So you don't have to do it now. You can wait until after we go over the rest of, I hope, Acts 1 and 2 on Monday. Can we go to Starbucks? Thank you. Have a good weekend. Okay, good. <laughs>